everybody. Welcome to our Meet on College Finance Financing Seminar. Um, my name is Amy Gallanter. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the guidance counselors here at Frontier. Um, the students whose last names begin with A through I are the ones on my caseload, so that might be why I'm not familiar to all of you. Um, we have a financial representative from the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority here with us. Her name is Sheila Kineski. And she will be giving a presentation on financial aid, the FAFSA, anything to do with that. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sheila. Thank you, Amy. Um, let me just share a little bit about myself with you tonight. Um, I'm one of the associate directors of financial aid at UMass Amherst. So I've been at UMass for about 34 years, so I have a good sense of what financial aid is all about. I've done this with two children. Uh, my daughter was in a five-year physician assistant program, and she was a Division I athlete, so I understand the ins and outs of what it's like to have a college student be an athlete. So if you've got some questions, uh, feel free to ask me the questions. If you can hold off your questions until the end, we'll give you plenty of time to ask your questions. And if you would like to ask me a question privately, I'll also stick around after, so if you want to come up and ask me your questions. I do have a couple of tips that I found were absolutely essential in helping students navigate the financial aid process. And the first one was we set up a Gmail account, a dedicated Gmail account. Most schools now are going to communicate with you electronically. They're not going to be sending you information in the mail. And so what I did was set up a, a Gmail account, a dedicated Gmail account for that information. So when we were filling out those college admission applications, anything like that, I would give that dedicated Gmail account. That way there was no concern about whether or not your son or daughter is going to share that information with you from their email account. You have a joint Gmail account or a Yahoo account, something that you can put on all your applications so that if they've got follow-up questions for you, you can put it on your FAFSA form. This way, everybody has access to the information and there's nothing that's going to slip through the cracks. The other thing I did was for every single school that my son or daughter were interested in applying for, I created a folder. And you will be amazed how much information you're going to put into that folder for each school. So if they've got 10 different schools that they're interested in, set up a folder for each one of those schools. You can put their admission application, a copy of the admission application in it. You can have a folder for all your passwords if you want to keep them electronically, whether you want to keep a copy. So it's just, and you will be amazed at how much information you're going to put in those folders. Uh, whether it's merit applications, whether it's essays, um, if they get selected for scholarships, you have all of that information in that folder and you, when you're making that decision about what school they're going to attend, you can go through all those different folders and you have all the information right there at your fingertips. Okay. So with that said, let's begin our presentation. So this presentation will last approximately an hour, and like I said, if you've got questions, jot them down, and I'm more than happy to answer your questions at the end. So a little bit about MIFA, Massachusetts Education Financing Authority. It is a not-for-profit state agency created in 1982, and their, their whole issue here is to help families plan, save, and pay for college, and they do a fabulous job for you. Keeping up tracking for college planning, NIFA.org is their website. They're also on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, at the bottom there, they have seminars. They have really great seminars. That's what you're here at tonight. They have really fabulous webinars. So if some of you are interested in filling out the profile form, you have to fill the profile form out, they will have a, a webinar for you on how to fill out the, the profile form. And then that last um, web address on the bottom, the mifapathway.org, that is for students to take you all the way from middle school up through graduation, helping students plan their careers. So there's a lot of really helpful, useful information on the mifa.org website. And they are the ones who sponsor this presentation tonight. So here's our agenda for the evening. We're going to talk about the types and sources of financial aid, 
the application process, how financial aid decisions are made, paying for college, and free resources. Now, I work at UMass Amherst, so occasionally I will put into my presentation a little bit of information on how we do it at UMass Amherst, but keep in mind that every school can do it a little bit differently. So first we're gonna talk about the types and sources of financial aid. So financial aid is simply money that helps students pay for college. And it comes from three main sources. Grants and scholarships, which is free money. That's the best kind of financial aid. You don't have to pay it back. Work study. Uh, work study is essentially a campus job. And it helps students pay for those indirect expenses. And we'll talk about what indirect expenses are a little bit later in the presentation. But work study is uh, essentially a campus job. Students are paid, for example, at UMass Amherst. They're paid bi-weekly. They're paid at least minimum wage. Some students earn more depending on the type of job it is. There is every job at UMass Amherst. It's like a small city, whether it's working on a farm or working in a lab, uh, working in dining services, helping professors with research. So depending on what the job is will depend on the rate of pay but it's at least minimum wage. Um, Work-study earnings are paid in a check to the student and is not used um, to pay the bill. Okay. And then the third kind of financial aid are student loans. And student loans are um, federal loans, and they're considered financial aid because of their special repayment um, options. Um, so those are the three different kinds of financial aid. So merit-based financial aid. So merit-based financial aid can be awarded in recognition of a student's achievement, whether it's academic ability, athletic ability, artistic, music scholarships. It may or may not be renewable, and it's not offered at every school. I always like to give the example of my son was awarded at his school a freshman scholarship. And so you would think that a freshman scholarship would be available just in the freshman year. So it's really important to ask questions about the kinds of merit awards that are given because that freshman scholarship, that was the name of the award, and it was available to him for all four years. So don't make assumptions um, based on something. Make sure that you understand the terms of the scholarships. They may have an application deadline, and some of those deadlines, because everything has been moved up a little bit uh, with the change in the financial aid application process. So some of those application deadlines may be earlier. So you need to make sure that you check with each school that you're considering applying for admission to about what their scholarship um, procedures are. Now some merit scholarships might have a GPA requirement for keeping it. So when you get that award letter with that merit scholarship on it, you want to make sure that you understand the terms of the scholarships. It can be something similar to a 3.0 GPA, or it can be something as high as um, a 3.8 GPA. One example of a merit scholarship that is not awarded by an institution is the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. And this is a non-need-based award. It's not based on a student's financial need. And it's based on the high 10th grade MCAS course. Um, and so it's called a scholarship, but it is essentially a tuition credit. So students can't stack those tuition credits once you reach the value of tuition. For example, at UMass Amherst, the, the value of tuition at UMass Amherst is $1,714. So a student could have a uh, John and Abigail Adams scholarship. They could have a parent who's an employee of the university and have a dependent tuition waiver. They could have the Stanley Koplik Certificate of Mastery, which is also a tuition waiver. My point in saying this to you is that there are many different scholarship and tuition waiver programs out there, but once you reach the value of tuition, whatever that tuition credit is, for example, at UMass Amherst, it's 1,714. You can't stack them and have multiple uh, scholarships and waivers that for the value of tuition. So most financial aid is awarded based on need. 
the family's ability to pay for college. And we use that need using a standard formula. It's called federal methodology. And the federal government, because it's federal methodology, has a, a say-so in how that formula is designed. And it includes the grants, the loans, and the work study. Um, and students need to be making satisfactory academic progress to maintain their eligibility for uh, financial aid. And satisfactory academic progress not only has a GPA requirement, but also a credit requirement. So for example, at UMass Amherst, after four semesters, students need to have a 2.0 GPA in order to be eligible for financial aid. And they must graduate within 10 semesters in order to be meeting satisfactory academic progress. So after the fourth semester, if a student is not meeting satisfactory academic progress for GPA for the first time, they are placed on warning. So they're eligible for financial aid, but we are essentially warning that student that they need to get their GPA up in order to continue to be eligible for financial aid. So every school can have a different version of satisfactory academic progress, but essentially it's going to be similar to what it is at UMass Amherst. There's a quantitative and a qualitative component to it. Sources of financial aid. So financial aid comes from the federal government, um, grants, work study, loans, tax incentives. It comes from the state of Massachusetts, Mass Grant State Scholarships, that John and Abigail Adams scholarship. It can come from the institution, so it's called institutional financial aid at UMass Amherst. It would be a UMass Amherst grant. Um, and then it can come from other agencies, scholarships. So right now Amy's going to come up here and she's going to talk about scholarships at Frontier Regional High School and how you get them. Hi everyone. Um, so we do have a scholarship update that's updated about every four to six weeks and it's on the guidance webpage on the Frontier website. In addition to that, we have a hard copy that's available in the office. Um, what you're going to be seeing right now on that um, scholarship update is many different national scholarships. So the pool for those is very large. Come the spring semester, we have many more regional um, Western Mass type scholarships and many more local ones that are mainly to the four towns. Um, and we really hope our students are focusing on those regional and local ones just because the pool is a bit smaller. In um, February, we do release our Frontier Financial Aid form that we need to have received back by every student in order for them to be eligible to receive some of our many different scholarships. Um, there are ones that we choose here at the school um, and ones that we have to give out to outside agencies and they want the application information from us. So that will become available sometime in February and we'll make all of our students aware of that at the time. But as of right now, it's mainly the national ones and you can keep checking that on our guidance webpage. So this is a slide that essentially shows you um, the breakdown of federal financial aid funds. So the big takeaway from this is that there's $184.1 billion in scholarship financial aid funds. And you'll see that the biggest, the biggest bubble is the federal student loan program with 33%. And then the smallest bubble is federal work study with 1%. Um, but these, there's all different kinds of financial aid funds and these are the different distribution of it. So now we're going to talk about the application process. Okay, so um, before we start talking about the application process, um, this first one is very important, financial aid timeline. So what you should be doing right now, you're going to be able to start filling out your FAFSA form on October 1st. So what you should be doing right now is going to all the different schools that you're interested in applying for financial aid and finding out what their application deadline is, what their application process is, um, because schools can have uh, different application process. So the, the, the most important thing to understand is that every school has their own process. There's, one, there's not one standard process. There's not one standard deadline. Um, you can start filling out that application for financial aid on October 1st and pretty soon the admission applications are due. When is the, I think the deadline for early action is November, November 1 or November 15th. 
So you're right in the zone right now where you want to start thinking really clearly about what schools you're not only applying for admission for, but also what schools, what is the application process. So every school that you're applying for admission to, you want to go onto that school's website and find out what their application process is for financial aid. And I'm going to go on a limb here and make the assumption that everyone is applying for financial aid because there's something for everyone. It may not be the kind of financial aid that you're interested in, but there is something for everyone, and everyone in the room should be applying for financial aid. Um, even, even if just an unsubsidized student loan will understand what an unsubsidized student loan is in a little bit, but some applications for scholarships require that you fill out that FAFSA form. So you want to just routinely fill out the FAFSA form. It's free. Everyone should do it. Um, and don't submit the application late. Schools run out of money. Um, and so schools will award students financial aid, first come, first serve, but also students who meet their deadline. So for some schools, not only is it important to meet the deadline, you want to make sure that you get your application in there early because schools do run out of money and they do award students based on a first come, first serve basis for some schools. So like I said, every school is different. Um, standard deadlines are typically in February or March. Underscore, underscore, don't submit your application late. Okay. So the free application for federal student financial aid is required by all colleges. It becomes available on October 1st. You could go out onto the FAFSA, so FAFSA, the same here, and the number four, CASTER, and you could do a pre-application if you want to get started a little bit before October 4, 1st. And then you can upload your FAFSA forecaster information onto your FAFSA application so you're a little bit ahead of the game. Um, you need to have an FSA ID, so you want to be right now making sure that you have an FSA ID. Students and parents, at least one parent, needs to have an S FSA ID. Um, so you can go on to the FSA um, fsaid.ed.gov and get your FSA ID. Your FSA ID is essentially your electronic signature. Okay, that's how you sign your application. Did we lose it? <laughs> is this the one that we want to unplug? Yes. Um, the, the question is, can you print the application out and do it online? Um, there, you don't want to fill out a paper application. You want to make sure that you fill out the FAFSA.gov. And do not go on to FAFSA.com because they're going to charge you money. Um, it's FAFSA.ed.gov to fill out your FAFSA.gov. They took the ED out of it. Um, FAFSA.gov is where you fill out your application. Both the parent and the student need to have an FSA ID. Okay. Um, you're filling this out once annually, so once, once a year. It's not like you do this one and done. You're going to be doing this every year. And you can upload your tax information using the IRS data retrieval tool. So you don't need to put in your 2000. For the 2018 2019, award year, you'll be using your 2016 tax information. Okay. This is a little intermission, but I'm going to keep talking. So I'm going to keep talking even though we don't have a slideshow here going. Because there's so much information that is, is important for you guys to know. So you want to make sure um, when you're filling out your common application, if you're filling out the common application, it's optional for you to put a social security number on your common application. But if you're applying for financial aid, you want to make sure that you put that social security number on the common application because that's how, in the world of financial aid, we're going to match up your financial aid application to your admission application. So even though your social security number is optional on your common application, if you're applying for financial aid, put it down. 
because otherwise the, the financial aid office won't be able to find your admission application because everything we're doing in the financial aid office is based on your social security number. Okay? Somebody's asking a question? The student's social security number. Okay. That's one of the common mistakes in filling out the FAFSA application is parents will help the student fill out the application and they'll put their social security number on it by mistake. Yeah. If you're a non-filer, there is a, a, a box on the application for you to indicate that you're a non-filer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There, there is a, a, a box on the application that asks if you're a non-filer, and you would just check that box. So MIFA.org has great webinars <clears throat> on your getting an FSA ID. So if you have questions about that, filling out your FAFSA form, there's one, there's a, um, there's a webinar for filling out the FAFSA form. So. <laughs> so the question is, if a child is over 18, do parents have to put their information in? Yes. The question on the FAFSA will be, um, is the student 24 years old or older? So what else is reported on the FAFSA form? The student's citizenship status. The students have to be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen to re fi receive financial aid. Um, where the student, the colleges that the students are applying to. So you need to have the list of colleges. Every college will have an ID that you send it to so that we make sure that it's going to the right college. It's going to have the parent and the student data. Parents, uh, you would fill out the application if the parents are married, including same-sex parents. All parents who live together, whether they're married or not, so if you have two biological parents who live together but they're not married, you would put both of their information on that FAFSA form. If they're divorced or separated, you only include the custodial parent's information on the FAFSA form. And so a common question that's asked is, well, what if we have joint custody? Who is the custodial parent? Whoever provides the most support for that student. And that's something that you would decide as a family. Okay. You're going to include your income information, your 2016 your 2016 information is going to be reported on the 1819 the FAFSA. It's so hard to say that, 2018-19. Um, you're going to include your assets, your cash savings and checking account. And I always like to tell families, this question on the FAFSA is, as of today's date, what is the value of your cash saving and checking account? And I like to tell families, make sure you pay your bills before you answer this question. Okay, so, um, and then you're also going to include, you don't include your home, so don't include your primary home. If you've got a vacation home, you would include, you would include that vacation home as an asset. You don't include the value of your retirement, your life insurance, and if you are a small family business, you don't include your business, okay. You're also including the number in the household, and the number in college. Make sure that you include the student who's going to college and that number in the household. That's a common thing that parents <laughs> just report. So the question is, I, I receive a disability payment, and that will end once he goes to college. So you're asking me to put 2016's information, but it's not representative of what's going to be happening when they're in college. What you, you're going to need to do is to write an appeal to the college that the student ends up going to, and write that in a statement to the college. A lot of colleges have forms for you to fill out for that very, very reason. It's, it happens 
quite frequently that students have some sort of, and the same will go for uh, a job in high school. My son or daughter had a, a job and they were working 25 or 30 hours a week while they were in high school, but now they're going to college and they won't have that job. So their 2017 income is going to be less than their 2016 or 2018 income. That would be an appeal to the college. Okay. Oh, we're still not back. I'm going to keep going. So other financial aid applications is the profile form. So make sure you don't fill out the profile form unless you need to fill out the profile form because it's $25 for the first school and then $16 for each additional form. But if you are applying for financial aid, this is another, I think this is a great story. My daughter, when she was applying to college, she put down on one of her applications, no, we're not applying for financial aid. And then I filled out the financial aid applications and sent it off to the schools. And the school contacted me and said, hey, wait a minute, you said you weren't applying for financial aid. And I said, oh, I'm definitely applying for financial aid. So some schools, your, your admission application will go in a different direction if you're applying for financial aid, if you're not applying for financial aid. So make sure um, you know whether or not you're filling out, you, when you're filling out the admission application, whether or not you're applying for financial aid. And then when you're filling out the profile form, make sure that indeed you're submitting your application for admission to that school because it's gonna cost you for every application that you send your profile form out to. Um, the profile form becomes available on October 1st, and this year for the first time the non-custodial parent will need not to submit a separate application, a separate profile form, okay? I'm going to keep going. So, so the profile form, so the profile form is used by colleges that are more selective, that have larger endowment scholarship funds. So they're asking more information. So not only are they asking for information from the custodial parent, the FAFSA only asks for information about the custodial parent. The, the profile form will ask for information from both parents, both biological parents. They will ask if both biological parents are remarried. They will ask for both step parents' information. They will ask for the make and model of the car that you own. If you own other real estate, they'll ask for um, the date that you purchased your home and the purchase price, and they will use a calculator. So essentially, they're doing a completely different kind, as I said earlier, for federal, for FAFSA financial aid funds, federal financial aid funds. <clears throat> schools are using federal methodology, but schools use a completely separate methodology. It's called institutional methodology. So they can be more selective in the information they're gathering in order to give out those institutional scholarships. And they use the information from the profile form to gather up that additional data. Okay? Does that help? You want to make sure that it's I, I, it, not that you don't fill out the profile. Only fill out the profile for the schools that you are certain you're applying for admission to. Don't unnecessarily send in your profile form because it's going to cost you $25 for the first one and $16 for each additional school that you send that information to. And it's used for schools like Mount Holyoke College, Amherst College, Stonehill College, um, the more selective, the NESCAC schools, those kinds of schools. Um, so when you're, filling, when you're looking at the schools, um, to see what their application deadlines are, the application process. So schools can have um, three applications. They can also require an institutional application. Okay, so let's back up. So we've got all schools requiring the FAFSA form. Some schools, more selective schools, requiring a profile form. 
And then schools can also have a third institutional application. And you want to make sure that your information that you're putting on these three different applications is consistent. One of the questions on the profile form will be, how much do you think you can con contribute towards your son or daughter's education? So put something that's reasonable. Don't, put, don't overstate your ability to pay for college, but don't put zero, because the family is the primary per responsibility for paying for college. So um, put something reasonable on your application. So after you apply for financial aid, the, state, the colleges and the state will get the information electronically. So each school on the FAFSA form has an electronic number attached to it. And that's how we get the information at the school. And students will also receive a student aid report. So if you put that Gmail address, remember we're, we're going to put an email on the FAFSA form. If you, they will send you that student aid report electronically. When you get that student aid report in the mail or electronically, you want to look over the information that you put down and make sure that it's accurate. So if, you're, if you said that there was one in college and now there's going to be two in college, update that FAFSA form. If you estimated your income for some reason and now you can do the data retrieval tool, go ahead into the IRS and the, and the data retrieval tool and upload your tax information onto your FAFSA form. You want to make sure that your FAFSA information is as accurate as possible because that's the information that the financial aid office is going to use to put together your financial aid award. So if it's based on inaccurate information, then your award technically could be inaccurate at some point. And some schools will require students to uh, go through the verification process. So the verification process is essentially a process where we are going through and comparing the information that you put on your FAFSA form with your tax information. Okay. So the, the financial aid application is technically, so you're, once you submit that FAFSA form, you're not done. There may be follow-up forms, tax returns, verification worksheets. So, and more than likely, schools are going to communicate with you electronically over email. They're going to use that email address that you put on your admission application or on your FAFSA form. So you want to make sure that if a school is asking you for follow-up information to have your application be complete, that you submit it to the school as quickly as possible. Because once again, the funds are not there. Um, it's not unlimited funding, so you want to make sure that you get that, that, those documents in as quickly as possible. Utilize the IRS data retrieval tool to make corrections if possible. Um, so the Department of Education requires that we do this verification process. So you want to make sure that you're looking over those emails and making sure that if a school is asking for some sort of follow-up documentation, you get it in as quickly as possible. So how financial aid decisions are made. So are we, we're not going to get the visual of that. <laughs> OK. We'll keep going. Is this OK? You guys doing OK? Awesome. OK, so now we're going to talk about the cost of attendance. So the financial aid, cost of attendance. So when you go on to schools' websites, you may see two different cost of attendance. And here's the difference. So the admission, some websites will have the financial aid cost of attendance. The financial aid cost of attendance includes the direct expenses, the tuition and fees, and the room and board. But we're also going to include in the financial aid cost of attendance what does it actually cost that student to be a student for nine months? So we're going to put in the books and supplies. For UMass Amherst, we put in $1,000 into our cost of attendance for books and supplies. We figure students are going to spend about $500 a semester on books. We also know that students are going to have to leave campus at least a few times during the semester. So we put a travel allowance in there for them to leave campus. So we at UMass have $400 in our cost of attendance for travel. And we know that students are going to have personal expenses, whether it's that student who's coming from California who needs winter clothing, 
or the occasional movie ticket or food away from the dorm. So we put $1,000 into our cost of attendance for personal expenses. So the financial aid cost of attendance is always inflated by those indirect expenses. And that's what work study is used for, to help fund those indirect expenses. Students can't use it to pay their bill, but they can have a work study job on campus and it helps fund those indirect expenses that we factor into their cost of attendance. So the financial aid cost of attendance is the billed direct expenses along with those non-billed indirect expenses. So that's why sometimes if you look on, say, the school's main um, website and they might have one cost of attendance and then you look at the financial aid cost of attendance and you say, hey, how come this one's a little bit higher? It's a little bit higher because it's including financial aid cost of attendance always includes indirect expenses because that's what we're basing the students' eligibility on, are those direct and indirect expenses. So the expected family contribution is, the, is a calculated amount that the family can absorb to pay for one year of college. And so that same federal formula, federal methodology, is what we're using to calculate for every single family based on the information that you put down in that FAFSA form. And it's, we're calculating that expected family contribution with the understanding that the family has the primary responsibility to pay for college. And after that expected family contribution is determined, then financial aid funds will become available. So that expected family contribution, though, don't get confused and think that that's what the student will pay to go to that college. It is simply a number that we use in the financial aid office to calculate eligibility for financial aid. Every college is required to have a net price calculator. That net price ca calculator can be found somewhere on the school's website. And it's going to ask questions about a family's finances and the student's academics. And basically, it provides a personal estimated net price of what it will cost that student to go to that college. So look for that net price calculator on um, every school's website. Um, and it also includes merit-based aid on um, their net price calculator. Okay, so how do we determine a student's eligibility for financial aid? We're going to take that cost of attendance, that financial aid cost of attendance. We're going to subtract out the expected family contribution. And that is the student's need for financial aid. So um, let's just take, um, for example, you can have a zero expected family contribution. Our highest need families have a zero expected family contribution. So they would get the maximum federal grant money. They would get the maximum state scholarship. They would get the maximum institutional eligibility for financial aid. And then they would also get student loans. Um, colleges fill their students' financial need with financial aid from all sources. OK. So this I'm going to have to skip over because you can't see that. It's basically what this slide is basically doing is we have uh, a family of four with one in college. There are three families, family A, B, and C. They all make $75,000. The first family has no assets. The second family has $75,000 in assets. And the third family has $150,000 in assets. And so the difference, basically what the slide is, is trying to illustrate for families, or it is illustrating for families, is you're really not penalized for saving for college because the family who saved nothing for college, their ESC is, and the family who saved $150,000 for college, that family who has this $150,000, their expected family contribution is $7,115, and they would still be eligible for need-based financial aid. So while assets are considered in financial aid formulas, they really have a minimal impact on um, the expected family contribution. And the very next slide here is also illustrating how income affects that expected family contribution. So the first family makes $75,000, the second family makes $100,000, and the third family makes $150,000. They all, three families, have $50,000 in assets. 
the first family, the difference in the EFC from the first family, which has a zero expected family contribution, so that third family whose combined parent income is $150,000, their expected family contribution is $24,075. So clearly income plays a far bigger role in determining the expected family contribution than assets do. So the next slide that eventually you'll see this all, is comparing the cost of attendance to the expected family contribution. And this slide is representing to you that you don't want to not apply for colleges based on the sticker price. So we've got colleges on this, this um, slide that go all the way up to $60,000. And so the students' expected family contribution is $5,000. So at College D, that costs $5,000. Clearly, that student doesn't have any need for financial aid. But the student that's going to college D that costs $60,000, they have $55,000 of need in financial aid. And if you pick that right college, that that is the school that they're looking for somebody who is a tuba player from Frontier Regional High School, and they give them merit money, and they give them need-based financial aid, then you've picked the right college and you're eligible for financial aid at that school. So do not assume, just because the college is expensive, that you can't afford to apply um, to that school and go there. So this next slide is basically a barrel. And in the barrel, the first thing that goes into the barrel is the family's expected family contribution, which is $5,000. The next thing that goes in the barrel is scholarships. So the student has $9,500 in scholarships um, that could be merit scholarships. The next it could be $13,500 in grant money. That could be need-based grant money that that student is eligible for. The next thing that's in the barrel are student loans. So the maximum student loan that a freshman can apply for, a freshman uh, federal loan, is $5,500. Uh, $3,500 of that will be a subsidized loan. $2,000 will be an unsubsidized loan. We'll talk about unsubsidized loans in a few minutes. Work study, the student has $3,500 of work study, and they have unmet need of $3,000. So basically, this college costs $40,000, but the family's responsibility is also that unmet need. So unmet need is need that the student has that the college is not funding, okay? So you want to pay close attention when you're looking at the award letters what the unmet need is, okay? So in addition to the expected family contribution, the unmet need is also something that the family is funding, okay, for the school. So the next slide is talking about looking at how the award letters can vary. So the cost of attendance at the school is $40,000. The expected family contribution is $5,000. So the student has $35,000 in eligibility for financial aid. And basically, college A, B, and C can make up that eligibility in a lot of different ways. They could give the student um, work study of $5,500 or $3,500. They've got the maximum student loans. But if the student was a late applicant for financial aid, they may not give them any grant money. The other thing that you need to be very careful about is whether or not the school is going to include a parent loan, a plus loan for undergraduate students, which is a credit-based loan that some schools will include on their award letter, and that is a credit-based loan that parents have to apply for, and they may not necessarily be eligible for it. So the next slide is talking about paying for college, and this is where I'd like to have the conversation with families about talking about the past, the present, and the future, and having that kitchen table conversation about what we can actually afford to do when we're sending our son or daughter to college keeping in mind that sometimes um, it may be a four-year program, it might be a five-year program. My daughter's program is a five-year program. Um, are there other siblings in the house that are also going to college that you need to consider? Are you applying to schools that are local or far away? And if you're thinking about sending your son or daughter to a school that's far away, 
then I encourage you to go and think about what one trip is going to cost for you to get that student to that school because you're going to have to get them there in September. They're going to want to come home for Thanksgiving. They're going to have to come home at the end of the semester, the fall semester. They're going to have to go back in January. They're going to have to leave for spring break. They're going to have to come home at the end of the semester. And then you probably want to include one emergency visit. So that was, that was six visits. So think about that and figure out what that one trip is going to cost, times it by six or however many times you think that you're going back and forth, and add that on to the cost of attendance because that is something that you need to consider when you're thinking about a school that's far away. So the past, does the student have some savings? Are they going to have summer earnings? Parent savings, do you have a 529 account, which is a, a, the um, college savings plan? So how are you going to use your past savings, your present income? Um, how much are you willing to pay when that bill comes to you? Typically, schools will bill twice a year, in the fall semester, in, ju in July, and then again in December for the spring semester. Um, so how much are you willing to pay? Maybe on, most schools will also have payment plans. At UMass Amherst, we have a 10-month payment plan. Five payments go to the fall semester, and five payments go to the spring semester. So you can stretch out paying for college over 10 semesters for a small enrollment fee um, to do that payment plan. And then after you've thought about the past and the present, do you need to still think about how you're going to pay for college, and do you need to consider a credit-based loan? And there's a lot of different credit-based loans out there for students. Um, families to pay for. Typically, the student is not the borrower. Typically, they're a co-borrower on a credit-based loan. Um, so now let's talk about the federal direct student loans. The student is the borrower. There's no credit check. There are subsidized and unsubsidized loans. The annual limits are freshmen. They have $3,500 of a subsidized loan, $2,000 of unsubsidized. Sophomores have $4,500 of subsidized loan and $2,000 of unsubsidized loan. And then juniors and seniors have $5,500 of, of subsidized loan and that $2,000 of unsubsidized loan. So the subsidized loans, the difference between the subsidized and the unsubsidized, the subsidized loan is based on need. So the student has to have financial need for it. So go back to that cost of attendance minus the family contribution equals need. So the unsubsidized loan is not based on need. This is the point where there is something for everyone. So a student who does not have financial need. So for example, at UMass Amherst, the financial aid cost of attendance for an in-state student is $30,000. If that family's expected family contribution was $35,000, $3,500, $35,000, they would have no financial need, but they would be eligible for $5,500 in an unsubsidized student loan. The difference uh, between the unsubsidized and the subsidized loan is with the subsidized loan, the student has a six-month grace period after graduation before any repayment is required, um, or they have that grace period before the interest starts to calculate or any repayment is required. With the unsubsidized loan, the interest starts to calculate as soon as the loan is dispersed. And the student either makes that payment on that student loan or postpones it until after graduation uh, through capitalization. It's known as capitalization, but every year the loan will grow by the amount of the interest payment the student is not making. Okay. So while that unsubsidized loan is not by far the best means uh, a freshman can borrow $5,500 in an unsubsidized loan and not have, be the sole borrower and not have a credit check and help fund their college expenses. Um, there's also tuition breaks, so we don't need to talk about this here because this is for regional students. Um, mass transfer, the Gen Ed Foundation, guaranteed credit transfers from community colleges to the four-year publics. 
There's also the Commonwealth Commitment, which is guaranteed credit transfers from the community college to the four-year publics. There's no application or essay required. Guaranteed admission, and you receive 10% off, um, and then freeze on tuition and fees if there's a 3.0 GPA maintained. So the Commonwealth Commitment, and they just expanded the number of degrees that are available through the Commonwealth Commitment Program. Free resources, so FAFSA Day. Um, myself and the Associate Director at Amherst College are the um, co-chairs of the FAFSA Day at Amherst Regional High School. And that FAFSA Day, where we help families fill out the FAFSA form, is on November 7th, or 2nd at 7 o'clock. So November 2nd at 7 o'clock. Um, okay. And you need to register for that on the FAFSA Day website. It's fafsaday.org. So you go on to that fafsaday.org website, and you can register and show up. And we go through line by line and help families fill it up. Yeah. Yeah. It's at Amherst Regional High School. And then MIFA has these great understanding your financial aid and paying for college seminars. And so they usually start sometime in April. And so what they do is they um, have some financial aid experts and MIFA, and they go out on the road and they go to um, local high schools. I think Amherst Regional is absolutely a site for that as well. And you show up with your award letters from all your different colleges and you say, help me, help me decipher these award letters. Because every school can have their own unique award letter and um, financial aid professionals and MIFA staff will help you decipher those award letters and help you make a decision if you're having trouble making a decision about where to go to college. So what you can do right now, you can sign up for the MIFA emails. Um, you can get your FSA ID, definitely get your FSA ID, get your list of colleges that you're interested in sending your financial aid application to. I'm going to send Amy some tip sheets and she's going to post them on the Guidance Council website. There's some really great tip sheets, um, the three most important things you can do, the 11 most frequent errors that families make on their FAFSA form. I'm going to send her a whole bunch of information to help you if you still have some questions. You can always contact Amy, and if you've got questions tonight that you want to ask, feel free to ask away. Yeah. So you got a couple of questions there. Does my, the, I'm going to repeat the question and paraphrase it if I left something out. Does my financial aid stay the same for all four years? Um, and if I don't get a merit scholarship in my first year, is there a chance that I can get it once I'm there? OK, so the first half of the question. If your, financial, if your expected family contribution stays the same, then your grant eligibility should stay the same for all four years. Now, when I say it stays exactly the same, your US tax doesn't change, the number in the family doesn't change, if your information stays identical for all four years, then your grant money should remain the same. What will change is your unmet need, perhaps, because as you go through all four years, your eligibility for loans is going to increase. So you may see a change in your loans. As far as merit scholarships goes, it really, it, it's in your, all your best interest to be whatever schools you're interested in applying to, to go on their websites and scour them for um, scholarships. And for example, at UMass Amherst, you could start off in the, school of, the Eisenberg School of Management and be a freshman and not get a whole lot of merit scholarships from Eisenberg School of Management. But they have a dedicated scholarship website that students, upper class students, that do really phenomenal things in the program get awarded merit scholarships. So it really depends on the school, the college, um, and even the major that you're in. Okay. More questions? Yeah.
Yeah, thanks for that reminder. So Amy's question was, can you tell us a little bit about the timeline, especially since filling out the FAFSA has been moved up a little bit. So the FAFSA, you can start filling out, I'm going to use UMass as a, as a guide. So um, last year was the first year that the FAFSA form was available on October 1st. And typically, the admissions office will typically start sending out early action acceptances in mid-December. But we typically did not send out financial aid awards until sometime in March. So last year, um, we sent out our first round of financial aid award letters um, in December. So it's not like you have to make your decision about what college you're going to sooner. This just gives families more time to have your financial aid information, have your acceptance information, and make that decision about what school is the best school to go to. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at really You need to, so the question is, you're, you're doing early decision, you understand early decision is binding, not early action, you're doing early decision? Well, there's two. It's the one, yeah, it's the one, yeah. Okay, so um, early action, basically, the difference between. Okay, what's the difference between early action? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so early action is students apply for admission by whatever the deadline is, November 1st. And then sometime in mid-December, if you're admissible, you'll be admitted to the, to the school through the early action. Early decision, you only apply to a certain number of schools early decision. And if you are accepted early decision at that school, you are, it's binding, you must go there. Did I leave anything else? You can only apply to one school early decision. Whatever the deadline is for the school's financial aid, it is for the entire application. Okay. They don't have typically deadlines for, oh, get your FAFSA in by. November 1st and get your profile form in by November 15th and get your institutional application in by November 30th. And keep in mind, I think I said earlier, that sometimes the, the FAFSA or the profile form is just a piece of the application. If there's follow-up documents that are required, that's also part of making that application complete. Yeah. Go ahead. So the question is, can you clarify, once again, um, who fills out the FAFSA and the divorce situation? It's the custodial parent. So in terms of who is the custodial parent, it's either the, the parent that the student lived with the most in the previous 12 months, and if that student lived with both parents equally, it's whoever provided the most support. Who gave the better gift? No, it becomes, it's, it's really, it's up to the family to decide if, this, if the, their, the student lived with both parents equally and both parents equally provided the same support, then choose. It's up to the family. It's only, so if that, if that custodial parent has remarried, it would be the custodial parent and that spouse. Whatever is making up that custodial parent's family. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The profile form, the same thing as the CSS form. It's the CSS profile form. More questions? Well, thank you all for. Um, sitting here through a non-visual financial aid presentation. I really appreciate you coming out tonight. And if you've got more questions, feel free to come up and ask me your questions. And if you've got uh, an evaluation form, please complete the evaluation form.